So hey folks, hey. Rob with Two Guys in a Ride. Today we are with James Bone. And he's got a fantastic car and a fantastic story. We're out at the Back to 50s weekend at the State Fairgrounds in Minnesota. I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about himself and also about this fantastic car. All right. Uh, James Bone. I live in Roseville, uh, Minnesota, right, right here. And I grew up in western Wisconsin. And that's where I bought this car when I got out of the Army <laughs> in 1971. Okay. And uh, you'll probably be showing a picture of that. I just right. the day I brought it home to the farm, I, I'm standing in front of the car with my foot on the bumper, going, "Yeah, I got this great car. <laughs> what a piece of yeah, you know." So anyway, I I bought the car because I had seen it. A friend of mine had used to bring cars down from northern Wisconsin when we were in college, and he knew all because he knew all these old people in northern Wisconsin, and he knew what cool cars they had, and so when they <laughs> <laughs> just kind of morbid but when they died the guy you know he would he would show up at the widow's doorstep and say you know i could take that model a off your hands for uh, 50 bucks when she thought it was worth 25. so he'd buy these cars and trucks and they're fairly old and sort of unique yep. pristine yep. and bring them down to college the river falls where i lived yep. and he would put them on the street with a for sale sign and make four or five hundred bucks on a car and those in the late 60s that was some money yeah, yeah, yeah. so anyway he had this this car which I first saw in the late 60s before I got drafted okay and he had it sitting in my hometown on Main Street with a for sale sign on it like 800 bucks or whatever and that was like forget it you know yeah. I could be a, a $25 car right. years later I get out of the army the car is not sitting around anymore but I heard that Les, the guy that, that had the car, was still in town, ran into him one day, and I said, hey, Les, have you still got that old Pontiac? Yeah, I got that Pontiac. Would you be interested in selling it? Yeah, I suppose. Would you take 100 bucks for it? Yeah. So I bought the car. <laughs> So you kind of pulled the old deal on him, what he had done to the widows and widowers, maybe, by buying it at the right time. Maybe he was a little hard on times or something. He was, yeah, he was a little down on his luck. His marriage had, well, nobody knows who this is, so. <laughs> his marriage was not doing well. He, he had some other problems. He needed the money, so I took advantage of him. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so, but what about this car this specific car. You said he used to bring other cars down, so you've probably seen other cars. What about this specific car S talked to you and said, buy me? That's a very good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> but all I know is I saw the car sitting there with a for sale sign on it. It was it was complete. I mean, it wasn't a wreck. Right. It was nice. Shi it was shiny black. It had all the trim and all the stuff. It even kind of ran. Nothing. I mean, it was in good shape. There was something about the design of the car, uh, maybe late late 30s General Motors or whatever. But f two or three years later, after Vietnam and Army and everything, I still had that car in my head, and I ended up with it. So even though you can't really pinpoint what it was, it still called to you a couple years later, and it was still in your head, but you couldn't pin down exactly what it is. Now, I can think I can think of several things that I like about it. Uh, yeah, you know, I should own it maybe. Uh, we can talk. Uh, but it's the Art Deco trim on it, and the Art Deco look. I've always been a fan of that design and these 30s cars. So maybe that was. It was the subtle nuances of the Art Deco design that called to you more so than the car itself. I don't know. Well, I'm, I design kitchens and bathrooms for a living okay. and, and remodel them. I mean, I'm a full service. <laughs> and, and what business is that? Uh, kitchen and bath remodeling. I'm a contractor. Okay, but what's the name of your business? We're going to give you a shameless plug. It's just called Singular Design. Okay. Because I'm a singer. Singular Design. And, and I got to tell you, folks, he has a, a fantastic voice. He actually sang the national anthem at the show here today. He has doing it all three days. But back to the car um, and the shameless plug. Shameless. Uh, so, Thank you. <laughs> but it is. It's absolutely gorgeous. So tell us, what have you done to the car, though, since you've owned it? Or can you remember, can you remember that far back? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Painfully. <laughs> No, uh, when I first got it, uh, it was so complete that and and street. You got to remember, this is the early '70s, right. and street rodding was kind of like what? Okay. I mean, there were hot rods, right. you know, bucket tees and right. and little deuce coupes and stuff, 
But street riding hadn't really taken off by right. in the early 70s. Right. So my goal was to uh, was to restore it. And back in the day, and uh, I'm you know I'm back in the day you couldn't you couldn't just go online and find parts. No. So m long story short, it took me about six years to put together the right parts for the engine and rebuild the brakes and the, all that stuff to risk to quote restore it. Okay. So not only did I restore it, I, I kept it six volt original radio, all that neat stuff. Wow. Uh, but I put I I I put a, an Imron paint job on it. Okay. So I painted it a darker brown than it had been originally. Okay. Not this color. Right. So anyway, I restored it, put chrome reverse wheels on it, and drove it. Now, I think I remember from a previous conversation that uh, even though they didn't have online, they did have a lot of parts catalogs. And there was one in particular that I think everyone's well aware of, but you, uh, you used to use them quite a bit for some of the odds and ends and pieces and parts, and that was uh, J.C. Whitney, right? That's correct. On there, I know I've had a Volkswagen Beetle, and you can find anything you want to rebuild, rebuild a Beetle, so I'm sure you could find a lot of things that you could put on this car, maybe not original to the car, no. but at least you could put on them, and they did look period correct. Well, no. well, well there is a case in point. So... Uh, Whitney had all kinds of stuff for cars of this era, not not stock like General Motors parts, but just aftermarket stuff. Right. In, w in one case in point is this lo this lovely. It's called a cowl mount antenna. This is identical almost to the antenna that was on this car when I bought it. Another, the original antenna. This is like, and this was like, ten bucks. <laughs> and I mean, it's 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 good quality. It works as an antenna, and this is one thing I got from Whitney. There you go. Well, tell us now, what is, what is the power plant you have in the car? Well, it's, it came from an 86 Monte Carlo. Okay. And my goal when I, when I, oh, I should say, I drove it, I drove the car restored for okay. quite a while. Okay. But I got, I got a little bit scared doing that because I was always afraid something was going to break oh. and I wouldn't be able to fix it. Right. So, I, one thing led to another, and in the late 80s, I started thinking, well, I should either sell this thing or restore it, because I wasn't enjoying driving it. That was my goal. I loved the car, right. wanted to enjoy driving it. So, I st by this time, by the late 80s, all of this stuff was going on. Right. Street rods were starting to be the thing. Cars like this, cars parked right along, all along the street, right. were original-looking cars that they had modernized on the inside. So here was my goal. I saw what these guys were doing with the cars, and I thought, as a remodeler, maybe I can figure out my own way to do this. What I noticed was that guys were using parts from this car, the old Cutlass this, and Chevelle that, and, and uh, Bonneville that. Well, we, we've met probably 10 people here today who have a, uh, a Ford Mustang II front end. This car has that. There's a story there too. Okay, there's 11 people now. There's a story. Yeah, make it 12. Now, fat man front end, it's called. Okay. This car. Well, let me finish the thing yeah, about yeah, yeah. the no, street sorry, rod. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Guys who, who fixed up these cars. Number one, they did it themselves mostly. Right. And they went to junkyards and talked to guys to get the various parts: the V8 engine, the transmission, the rear end, yep. springs, whatever, to restore to make the car into a street rod. Okay. But I looked at it and I thought, hmm. What if I get just one car that has the engine I want, let's say? Okay. And so in St. Paul here, they had a thing called the salvage pool, okay. where if you were affiliated with an insurance company or had a membership, uh -huh. you could go in. The, the insurance companies had this thing. Cars that they had totaled and paid the owners off, they'd bring the car in and right. put it, and every week they'd have an auction. Okay. I found... An 86 Monte Carlo with 29,000 miles that had been hit in the side. Guess what I bought? Yeah. So for 700 bucks, I got a donor car for the whole thing. Wow. So this car I call the Montiac <laughs> because it's a Monte Carlo and a Pontiac mashed together. Yep. Anything that either moves or has electricity in it came from the Monte Carlo. The computer, the, oh. I adapted the windows, so the power windows from the Monte Carlo. Right activator arms everything so is it a is it the uh 231 six cylinder or is it a 305 eight cylinder it's a 305 eight cylinder four barrel 
with a 200 uh, automatic overdrive transmission. Okay. Yep. But the other reason I got the Monte Carlo was for the gauge cluster. So it's it's the Montiac, the Montiac. So it's 80, 86 Monte Carlo. Yeah, those are kind of cool cars too, though. But yeah, but it was kind of smart. So for 700 bucks, you bought one car yes. and you you used almost all the drivetrain and electrical parts on it. Everything out of that car okay. that I thought even remotely I could use. The okay. rear the rear axle, the, the front brakes, right. uh, in fact, everything. Except, except for the Mustang II front right, end. Right, for the, okay. yeah. So, what's next for this car? I'm just going to keep driving it the way it is. There I've got go. it. I've got it where I like it. Yep. Finally, after yep. how many years? Yep. Forty nine. some. Carry the nine at multiply times four. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know. Let's say almost fifty years. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. So I went from trying to fix it up so I could enjoy it to being like, I can't, I'm not enjoying this. Then I found a way to make it so I could enjoy it. To save it and to keep it because it meant that much to you as it was. So tell me, what is your most favorite thing about this car? The thing that I enjoy most about t uh, taking it out of the garage and going around uh -huh. to places is the fact that this car has looked like this for 30 years. And I still, when I pull into the fairgrounds with it, you can hear people talking as you go by. Right. People still like the paint job. People yep. still like the car. Yep. And I'm not sick of it. Yeah. You know, I, I have a pretty low boredom <laughs> threshold, but this car meets it. It, it this exceeds boredom every time. I'm, I never get sick of the paint. Yep. I never get sick of hearing it fire up. Yeah. So I don't know what I'd do without it. That's cool. That's what I like to hear is because it had so much of a, a meaning to you yeah. from way back, but it's still, you had, even though you can't point to that thing, you still have that love for it that it just escapes you, but you had enough love for this vehicle that even when it was no longer fun, you said, I'm going to double down and I'm going to make it fun again and I'm going to continue to enjoy it, and yep. you get the recognition like we see everybody here. Everybody yep. likes to look. I mean, you're not craving, I'm not saying that you're one of those people that craves recognition, but it's just a cool car, folks. Come on, look at it. And you were on the cutting edge of, of, of riding it, too, well, that when, when they really didn't understand it, you were probably uh, probably misunderstood, maybe a little bit, or you uh, think, or did, was, there, was there culture kind of building at that time when you... Oh, when absolutely. You, it was. Okay. Yeah, but the the uh, the means for communication about uh, the, the hobby or right. about the activity was in its sort of in its infancy okay. and sort of, uh, well, the only way you could find out about stuff for your car was to, like, uh, uh, you, you would subscribe to a Street Rider magazine. Okay. Yep. Or anything that had to do, there was a magazine called Street Rider. I okay. don't know if it's still there. Okay. But you would flip every episode, or every, every right. issue, right. you'd flip through and you'd go to the ads. Yeah, yep, and yep. you'd see what, what Fat Man had, or what this, the, there were companies down in Iowa uh, that, that were yogis, I think was another one. Okay. I don't want to give a, you know. Right, right. I understand. But you know, the way you found out about it was through print media. Right. Then you picked up the phone. Like not a cell phone, right, right. and you called these guys yeah, and the talked to them. <laughs> well, I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you would call these guys and say, "Here's what I got. Here's what I need. What can you? What? Uh, this is a fabulous thing. It looks like you got. How do I get it?" So you give them your credit card number, and they'd send it to you. That's and that's cool. how. And nowadays, geez, I mean, I can't even. I don't even know. Right. Well, I know what I would do, but you couldn't do that then. And it well, was coming to shows like this, too, where you'd see what other guys had done. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. Then, you know, once you started traveling the shows and actually enjoying yep. it, you made those connections with other people. Oh, and you shared those stories. Hey, that's cool. What have you got there? I like it. Where did you get it? And yep. then you guys would build those Ooh, connections. There's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could do that in my car. Right. And you talk about it, and yep. that's how it works. And that's yep. what makes this, I think... One of the, uh, it's a premier activity. It's a it, I, well, I call, I refer to it as a sport. I love it because you, you play it, it's fun, you interact with people, uh, and sometimes there's winners. It shows that are judged. That's yeah, cool. But, but to show. me, this isn't judged. Nope. But I think you get judged anyway, whether you know it or not, because <laughs> little kids, older folks, yep. men and women will walk by these cars and they'll look at it and it will evoke a memory. Precisely. And that's something a dash plaque or a trophy will never really equal nope. because you just made someone's day because they said, I remember when. 
and that's really cool. Yeah, uh, and Jim. you hear it when you have a car like this, you yep. hear those little stories all the time. Exactly, yeah. and just makes you grin. I know. Yeah. I well, am? thank you so much for well, sharing you're your car. You're welcome. Thank Fantastic you. story, fantastic yeah. job. Thanks, guys. Thanks.